Grace and peace be with you all. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Let us be attentive to the word of our Lord and let the Holy Spirit illuminate for us. Jesus said there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner received evil things. But now he is comforted here, Listen to that. And you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, then send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Notice he doesn't say they have Jesus, because Jesus has not yet come. This is a pre-incarnational parable about what the invisible world was like before Jesus come and redeemed us. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Speak to us today, Lord, not from the outer court or the inner court, but from the very holy of holies. Give us divine instruction. Fashion us, chisel us, Lord, into a more perfect image of your Son, Jesus Christ, that your kingdom may be established here in this place, in this time, in a way that others will hunger for it, embrace it, receive it, and live it. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. For so many years, this has been a scripture that has been used to scare people with hell and promise them heaven. But it's an Old Testament parable. Parables are not literal and they're not metaphorical. There's something between. They're mystical. You can't take this literally. Jesus never intended the parable to be literal. He said that he speaks in parables so those who have ears to hear can hear. He never intended us to take a parable and go scare people with religion. That was never his intent of this. But yet, when you try to literalize mystery, you end up confused. And sometimes I ask myself, what is this parable really saying to me? 
And like most of you, I'm downtown sometimes and I see a homeless person or I see a person at a stoplight with a sign that says, please help, God bless, or a mother with children or a guy with a dog feeding his dog on a corner. And sometimes I ask myself, is that Lazarus? And of course, we justify everything. Well, the greatest lie ever spoken to this generation was God helps those who help themselves, but not according to this parable. God helps those who need help through his people. God helps those who need help because the name Lazarus means God will help. And so here's this man who is obsessed with his earthly image because the parable says he had fine linen and he ate scrumptiously and he's totally blinded to the God will help icon that sits at his gate every day. Because when you become earthly, worldly obsessed, you become blind what the mission is from God. Lazarus means God whom God helps. And if we are Christ in the earth, that means we should be looking for who needs help rather than criticizing who's struggling. We should be offering our time and resources. See, the problem is not money. Jesus never, God never had a problem with money. It's the love of money that leads us into all kinds of evil because the love of image and money will blind us to the Lazarus that is sitting at our gates. Can I get an amen? This is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of enlightenment and message of awakening. I know we have a lot of chairs that are not filled in here. This place needs to be filled with Lazaruses, not people in rich purple, scrumptious living, unless they're willing to recognize who's at their gate. All are welcome. But you know the kingdom's really growing when the hurting and the needy are being brought in. When you see a homeless person or a person at a stoplight holding that sign, do you ever ask, is that Lazarus? And a better question is, am I the rich man? Will he one day be com comforted in the bosom of Abraham while I'm in torment? I don't really think that's what this parable is saying. Would $10 for a homeless person be enough, or should it be $20, or should it be $30, or is 25 cents enough? Are you with me? Should I invite him to lunch, have him to my house for dinner, or maybe let him spend the night, or buy him a motel? What is enough? This is not about that. This is not about rich people go to hell and poor people go to heaven. This is about God giving us resources to establish the kingdom of God through a merciful, compassionate heart in other people's lives. Those are the kind of questions that arise when we interpret parables literally, turning them into a story of historical fact rather than a, a place of vision. When we do that, the questions are usually endless and unanswerable. We can't treat parables as merely metaphor or symbolism that have no real life implications for how we live. So what about today's parable? What is it saying to us? And what is it not saying to us? You know, this rich man's assignment, the rich man's assignment was Lazarus. This was the rich man's assignment. God is concerned about the poor and expects us also to be concerned. That is clear throughout scripture in both Old Testament and New Testament. We reveal God's presence in our lives by sharing God's concerns and by acting as God acts. That is our job. That's why we have the Onama. Our job is not to be a consumer, but to be a caretaker. And as the epistle said today, many people have left the faith. They don't even participate in the faith. They may attend the meeting, but they leave the faith because they're obsessed with money and with material. That's the only place they can feel good about themselves. When we should feel good about ourselves, when we help the Lazarus sitting at our gate. That does not mean that the poor are our ticket to heaven in any way, shape, or form. That's what I love when uh, you can always recognize a person who has a, what I call a nonprofit heart. 
I see that in my granddaughter. I see someone who cries on the back porch because one of the girls she's helping at Hope House has not shown up for two days. Doesn't matter how much you make, it matters what's going on in your life with the people who need our resources. The resources are not only money. Our resources may be just our presence and our time and our encouragement. Resources go far beyond money. The question isn't what's in it for me. The question is what's in it for them. Y'all are awful quiet in this new cathedral today. I don't want Paula to think we're stoic here. <laughs> we can get excited. But listen, beloved, second, there's a relationship between this life and the next life. This is very interesting because actually Father Rohr wrote something very important this morning. He said the visible world is an active doorway. The visible world is an active doorway to the invisible world. And the invisible world is much larger than the visible world. This is called mystical insight, the mystery of incarnation. Matter is and has always been the hiding place for spirit. So if we have the Holy Spirit, our lives are the hiding place for God to take care of Lazarus. Knowing not, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the incarnation of Christ when, while he is the incarnation of God. What does our Christianity, our faith, our experience of Jesus Christ offer them? Second, there is a relationship between this life and the next life. The choices we make, the words we speak, and the actions we take in this life have consequences in the next life. Now don't push that too far, far with this story, beloved. Today's gospel is not a systematic explanation of theological analysis of heaven and hell. That's not what it is. The story is not a judgment that the rich people go to hell and the poor people go to heaven. This story isn't so much about our future, but about our present moment now. It's about how we live here and now. It's a reminder that our lives are connected, our lives are intertwined in this world and in the next world to come. The only thing you're taking to heaven is your relationships. You're going to take Lazarus before you take your Lamborghini. Your Lazarus is going with you first because that's what we were created for was relationship. And you can always tell when someone's been blinded by earth, a worldly image, is they begin to isolate away from relationship and begin to become independent and isolated and withdraw. And they don't find being close in community comfortable because they're obsessed with material. Quiet today. In the words of St. Anthony the Great, our life and our death is with our neighbor. Our life and our death is with our neighbor. It's just plain arrogant to judge myself as a rich man and anyone else as Lazarus because there's been times in my life I was a Lazarus, hurting, maybe not financially a Lazarus, but emotionally a Lazarus, spiritually a Lazarus, who needed someone to be God to me. Remember the chasm in the end? These things are separations and divisions. The gate is a separation and division. He sat at the gate, and we have to remove, open the gates and remove the chasms between us. The gate and the chasm are the same thing. The chasm that separates Lazarus and the rich man in the next world is simply a manifestation of the gate that separated them in this world. That's why Christ came. He came so we could be one family in God. No longer a separation Jew, Parthenian, Scythian, male nor female. In the spirit, there's no separation. There is no gate and no chasm in God. Can I get an amen? The rich man cried with him. He carried it with him into the next world. He carried this separation with him into the next world. So when he saw Lazarus there, he saw the separation between him and himself. The gate is a condition of the human heart. The gate that becomes a chasm always exists within us before it exists between us. I'm about to finish. 
Each of us must continue, must examine our own heart and find the gates that separate us from ourselves, our neighbors, our enemies, those we love, and ultimately the gates that separate us from God. What are those gates for you? What are the gates that separate you from true community and relationship? What are they for me? What are they for this community? What are the gates that keep us from connecting? For the United States of America, what gates do we live with? Fear, anger, greed, pride, prejudice, loneliness, sorrow, addiction, busyness, indifference, apathy, hurt, resentment, envy, or cynicism. Those are all gates that divide and separate us. Beloved, there's a lot of possibilities for the gates within us. We all have them. That's not how we are intended to live. That's certainly not how Jesus lived. Gates destroy relationships. We call them walls. Quit putting up your wall. That's a term we use modern. Oh, well, you're putting up a wall now. Walls separate us. The silent treatment separates us when we don't talk to somebody for three days because we want to manipulate them with silence. Those are gates that divide us. Rather than show humility and say, if I've offended you in thought, word, and deed, please forgive me. They unmake God's creation. Gates and walls unmake God's creation. Beloved, if you could be free of anything today, I would pray that you'd be free from the walls and gates that you use to protect yourself from other people. Can I get an amen? amen. I love y'all. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to set you free to enjoy this life. He come that we would have life and have it abundantly, but you can't have an abundant life in isolation with walls and gates up protecting. There has to be a vulnerability. There has to be a transparency in order to really enjoy life. What gates do you carry within you, beloved? Because I asked myself that this morning when I was on my walk, what gates are you carrying, Paul? Because people tell me all the time, Bishop, you're distant. I tried to say hi to you and you ignored me. Because when you get obsessed with your self-image and how busy you are, you become blind to the Lazarus that needs your attention. What gates do you carry within you? Every time we love our neighbor as ourselves, every time we love our enemies, every time we see and treat one another, as created in the image and likeness of God, gates are open and chasms are filled. It's a choice set before us every day, beloved. It can happen in our marriages, it can happen in our families, it can happen at work, it can happen at school, on the corner of the parking lots, and in our prayers for the world. It can happen in most intimate of relationships with strangers or even with our enemies. It's not easy work, but it's possible. Turn to somebody and say, this is not easy work. But with the grace of God, all things are possible. Let your gates be opened and your chasms filled. This is our work and the salvation of the world. It's what the kingdom of God looks like. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. It looks like a people who have no walls and no gates and no chasms between other people. I love what Alex said today. Leaving that system of image that blinds us from the need of the Lazaruses who need God to minister to them. The title of my message today was, Don't Diss Your Lazarus. Don't discount. Don't discourage. Don't diss your Lazarus, because your Lazarus is where you manifest the kingdom of God. Abraham was not denying them anything, either one of them. Nothing was lacking for either of them. They already had everything they needed. The world of God that opens gates and fills chasms is the same word of God that proclaimed by Moses and the prophets. Stand to your feet with me this morning and let's pray. The very same word embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, the ascending Christ, not the crucified Christ, the one ascending, leading captivity captive. Now this is our mission 
to not ignore the Lazaruses at our gate. I'm too busy. I work long hours. I have a family to raise. I've already paid my price. I've already done my work. See, there's an anointing on this church right now. The anointing is, I will build my church with hurting people who are transformed. Not with people who already know everything. It's not easy to come to this type of neighborhood and start a missionary work because people are busy. But everybody comes to a point in their life where they need answers. And the question is, will we recognize when they're sitting at our gate? And will we, we be ready to share what we have? See, I love it because Lazarus did not want to eat what the rich man ate. He just wanted what was left over from the rich man. He wasn't wanting to take what he had. He just said, that which you waste, share with me. Don't we all have a little extra? Don't we all have a little extra time? Don't we all have a little extra money? Don't we all have a little extra talent to share? Isn't there some Lazarus that maybe smells in a way we're not comfortable with or looks a little bit? The chasms are sometimes beauty and being ugly, sometimes intelligent and ignorant, sometimes strong and weak. But this is where the kingdom manifests. And I know this. And mark it down that I said it. That's the way God will build this house. With Lazaruses. With Lazaruses who are cared for in their worst time of need. There's enough churches out there entertaining people. God bless them. They do what they do, and they're in God's kingdom. There's enough churches out there who have softball leagues, bowling programs, women's ministries, and men's ministry, God bless them. I hope they flourish in what they do. But I want a people who will not ignore the Lazarus at their gate, that we may change the world. The meaning of Lazarus in Hebrew is God is my help. God is my help. So when we help someone, God is helping them. We don't get the glory, he gets the glory. We are Christ in the earth. Beloved, I beseech you, do not overlook, do not diss your Lazarus. Bow your heads as we pray today. Thank you, Father, now for this message that has been misappropriated and mistaught in the postmodern world. We've made it about our reward or our punishment when it's really about our connection with each other. We've made it something that isn't. And we pray, Father, that we would awaken, remove the scales from our eyes, let us see the opportunities we have to be God's help to someone else with purity of heart and sincerity of heart we pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God.